now hear from an exchange with uh, Jonathan Glover, who is a philosopher. Many years he taught at Oxford University, then moved to King's College London, where he's now Professor Emeritus. Professor Glover has made seminal contributions to theoretical aspects of bioethics. He set many milestones in the field, really setting the agenda, the questions that later generations of scholars would follow, questions concerning end-of-life decision-making, human enhancement, and reproductive technologies. His original work has also spanned to other topics, including human nature, war and the Holocaust, genetic ethics, neuroethics, and questions concerning dilemmas in psychiatry. The originality of his thought is marked by the role he has played in these debates. And as uh, Baroness Mary Warnock has hinted at, he really has been looking into the future, uh, discovering in advance the kind of problems that we would be facing decades later. Professor Glover has written several books on ethics. They will be discussed shortly, uh, but let me just mention some of them, Responsibility, Causing Deaths and Saving Lives, What Sort of People Should There Be, Humanity, A Moral History of the 20th Century, Choosing Children, Genes, Disability, and Design, Alien Landscapes, Interpreting Disorders of Mind, most recently. Um, Professor Glover is a fellow of the Hastings uh, Center, as you all know, an independent bioethics research institute in the United States. Professor Glover is also a distinguished research fellow at the Oxford Center for Practical Ethics. Um, he has, in addition to his uh, academic work, he has also contributed to the public discussion of questions of bioethics. And just to give one example, is a BBC Horizon documentary on brave new babies. Though I have known Professor Glover uh, for only two days, I can attest that he is also a charming person with a wonderful sense of uh, humor, I may I must add. And uh, Professor uh, Glover's interlocutor today will be Professor David Head, um, a philosopher, Israeli's uh, leading uh, bioethicist, a professor emeritus from the Hebrew University, and most recently a laureate of the prestigious Emmet Prize. Please. Thank you, Shai, and thank you, everybody, and thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I hesitated whether to call uh, this exchange an interview or a conversation, because on one hand, conversation is more pleasant, but then in, the interlocutors are given uh, equal time or equal status, and we are celebrating today your prize. Make so, so, so I thought it could be an interview, and I'll do. You'll do mo most of the talking, but I warn everybody that it will be a very unprofessional interview because the interviewer is biased and uh, in favor of the interviewee, which is not proper in proper interviews. Uh, I've known Jonathan Glover for now 45 years. He was his student in Oxford in the 1970s. Yes, uh, we are that age already. And um, actually, I took part in a seminar uh, uh, that he uh, co-taught with uh, Jim Griffin and uh, Derek Parfit which we students were not aware at the time that it would become a mythological, legendary seminar uh, in the history of uh, philosophy in Oxford. And uh, this was really a very formative uh, experience for me and for my other students. Uh, they were all very young at the time, energetic, full of ideas. They uh, had different temperaments, uh, but all three of them uh, were thinking about uh, really new original issues that uh, became the basis for their respective important books. You know, Jim Griffin was well-being, and Derek Parfit was reasons and persons, and you with your uh, causing death and saving lives. And we students, uh, for us, it was more of a performance or a show, because usually, you know, if even if the teacher is very uh, energetic and articulate, still there are students. But 
they were three of them uh, talking to each other very in polemical way, never agreeing uh, on each other, and they, they, the uh, seminar was on their own uh, work in progress, which was really a laboratory of ideas in the real, full, uh, genuine sense of the word. So they were really invested in their ideas, and um, we, we sat there at the back. Uh, I don't remember what our role was, but we had a lovely uh, time. So that, that is what makes me, my, my credentials, let's say, as an interviewer uh, tonight. Uh, so let, let's go now to, to conversation, if you like. Um, I remember that uh, in the 1970s in, in Oxford, uh, the time, uh, let alone in the 60s when you formative years for you in your philosophical education, Oxford wasn't really interested in what is called now applied ethics. The concept did not exist at the time. And uh, till today, I haven't solved that problem between myself, you know, uh, my, uh, I myself, uh, whether there's such a thing. I think Aristotle would have shrugged it off. Uh, what, what do you mean by applied ethics? After all, after all every ethics should be or is applied if it's genuine uh, ethics. So I wonder how can, you, that, that's more biographical, intellectual biograph, biographical question, how did you move from that um, Oxford general atmosphere into the kind of work which you uh, uh, really uh, started with uh, causing uh, death and saving lives, Although you had that book on responsibility, which had already uh, that touch of it, although it was still mainstream Oxford philosophy. First, can you hear? Is this, oh, good. Because uh, I'm quite capable of talking for 10 minutes without anyone, anyone hearing, because the switch hasn't come up. <coughs> um, firstly, the phrase applied ethics. Uh, I got used to this phrase because it's been in, in use among philosophers for quite a long time. But I was once at a conference in New York sitting next to Jim Watson, one of the DNA people, and uh, when somebody said applied ethics, he whispered to me, you mean most of it isn't even meant to be applied? <laughs> <laughs> um, I got into it, but I mean, the thing is, when I, when I went to Oxford, uh, I had been interested in philosophy at school, as a schoolboy, and I'd been very interested in quite abstract questions like, you know, I noticed that people I knew had utterly different beliefs from each other about religion, about morality, about politics, about whether science was the right way to understand the world. And so I was enormously eager to study philosophy more, and when I arrived at Oxford, there was a huge amount of how do we know anything at all, uh, do we know other people are conscious, uh, even slightly dotty sounding questions like could I feel a pain in someone else's foot. Um, but I, and I was enormously inspired by the sharpness and clarity with which people debated these issues. But at the same time, I was, it was the beginning of the, the 60s, uh, there had been rather horrible atrocities carried out in Kenya by British colonial people, and there was huge debate about that. There was the question of whether nuclear weapons were justifiable and so on. There were these huge issues. And I, as an undergraduate, I felt that half of my interests were somehow separated from the other half. I was very lucky because in moral philosophy, I had Alistair McIntyre as a tutor, who at that stage was a, a Marxist. He's been everything just about uh, <laughs> across the ideological spectrum. But at that stage, he was a Marxist. And I hardly agreed with anything which he actually said. But he was constantly challenging. And he did make me feel that philosophy, and particularly ethics, really could be relevant to the real world. So I, 
thinking about it, I thought, uh, I should say that first book of mine was my postgraduate thesis. Uh, it reads, alas, like a postgraduate thesis. But when I moved on to causing death and saving lives, I wanted to write something which would reach out to people and stimulate people to think about killing in general. People thought about war, people thought about euthanasia, people thought about abortion, but rarely linked them up. And I wanted to provide a kind of overall view. Definitely you manage, because as you mentioned, the in, in private exchange, I mean, it, it, there were a few works on so-called applied ethics before your book, like Philip of Foot, uh, Crowley, and then uh, Thompson on abortion, but your book certainly was the first systematic work on killing and, and uh, causing death and saving lives, and in that respect was, was definitely a, a turning point. I want to, to go to the, your next book, uh, What Sort of People uh, Should There Be? Because of my personal interest, uh, in which I followed much of your, your, your work, and uh, it was for me personally a very important uh, a book in forming my idea about ideas about uh, future people and their standing in uh, morality, uh, moral theory. And here I, I may have a different approach to you, but I want to, to uh, put a question to you regarding the, the way you consider the nature of value in general. Because you also hesitate between what is called the person-affecting view, uh, which was developed by Derek Parfit in the seminar I referred to um, earlier, and the more impersonal view about good for the world. And that is very relevant for the question about future people. That is the kind of issue which raises, for the first time in the history of philosophy, the question about the nature of uh, value. And you, you argue for what is called the mixed view, uh, uh, which uh, has both elements in it. Let's put it as in the dramatic way, which is called the last man um, a philosophical experiment. Would the last man on earth, uh, when humanity is going to be uh, irreversibly destroyed, and he or she is going to be the last person, uh, is her oblig or his obligation or duty not to destroy, for example, the Mona Lisa or bomb the Grand Canyon, you know, things we uh, uh, hold as deeply valuable. Would there be any value after the extinction of the human race altogether? That has, I think, um, implications for the question about the way we treat future people in the more realistic. Yes, yes I think that's right. Um, I think that uh, in the last man case, the last human being case, uh, leave aside that there might be alien beings who'd come and rather like the Grand Canyon when they arrive here. Leave, leave aside those kind of issues. Uh, let's suppose that you know, life anywhere in the universe is going to be permanently extinguished. Then I actually don't have an objection to destroying the Mona Lisa as one walks out and shuts the door or whatever whatever it is. That, in a way, uh, is that because I think that the only things that ultimately matter have to do with conscious beings, particularly human beings, but also animals and other species that may be capable of suffering or of benefiting. Oh, I'm so sorry. I told you I could do this. Uh, please, you know, shout at me, raise your hands, you know, let me know if I, if I forget again. Um, but on the other hand, I think there are some things which fit Derek Parfit's idea of impersonal values. Because one of, the, I mean, Derek Parfit is, as we all know, so brilliant. And one of the original ideas he had was that um, if we... Most of us, very likely, would not exist if the First World War had not happened. I'll just take my own case. Uh, my grandmother uh, 
loved a man who was killed in the First World War, so she couldn't marry him, so she married another man who was my grandfather. And that kind of thing is repeated over and over again. If I'd had, if, if she'd married someone else, then she wouldn't have had the same daughter who was my mother, and it's highly unlikely that I would have existed. So the point that Derek makes from this rather uh, kind of engaging thought is that um, the policies we adopt, for instance, towards the environment, are likely to lead to different policies, are likely to lead to different people being born. And over time, it's quite possible that two different policies would result in utterly different populations. So if one chooses the less good one, suppose we choose to go on burning fossil fuels and mess up the environment. If we do that, uh, there, won't, there won't be anyone in the future generation who is harmed by that because they wouldn't have existed unless we had adopted this bad policy. And so people who say the only thing that matters is there must be some people who are better off or worse off, that seems wrong. Because I want to say, and Derek does, I know too, or did, sadly did, uh, Derek, Derek wants, wanted to say, um, we should choose the less bad or the better world, even if they're quite different people. And so the particular people being harmed question doesn't arise. So in one way, I want to say, yes, it doesn't matter if people aren't involved, you know, then you burn the Mona Lisa. But on the other hand, uh, I think there are some impersonal principles in a slightly different sense of impersonal. Well, I think I have better teeth than you have because I can chew the bullet of, uh, <laughs> you know, the person affecting. I, I would uh, follow uh, half its original uh, concern uh, with uh, the more actualist uh, kind of person affecting version. But okay, so I will ignore the insult to British dentistry. <laughs> <laughs> So let's move now to, which is um, of course uh, connected to the previous question, but uh, you have developed a lot of interest uh, in uh, neuroethics and part of your speech uh, the day before yesterday in the uh, prize winning uh, ceremony was also uh, dedicated to uh, that concern that you have about the future in which we lose control over the kind of people or maybe not even people in the human beings in the uh, strict sense of the word. Uh, I wonder, uh, that's the first um, sub-question here is, do you really believe that we neuroscientists can uh, uh, really support their promise to be able at one stage in the future to read thoughts or to find a direct correlations between what happens in our brain and what we call mental states, conscious mental states. A, I have a, a, I don't understand anything about the science of it, but I have serious philosophical doubts about this very principled possibility. And I wonder a, what your attitude to that is and if you think there's a, a, a principle, the a obstacle a, a here, then maybe your concern should not be overstated or exaggerated. Yes, okay. Uh, you mentioned that book, What Sort of People Should There Be? It was about the future of genetics and the future of neuroscience and right, the right. problems they would raise. Right. And uh, you're absolutely right that whereas the book, when it first came out, was dismissed as being ludicrously futuristic on all points. <laughs> Most of the genetic stuff has come about. More or less none of the neuro, neuro futures or neuro dystopias I invented have come about at all. So <laughs> that just shows that, I mean, I think the, the hype of neuroscience is often uh, much more effective than the actual progress in the subject, uh, as against the genetics, which, well, we saw some striking instances of progress in that kind of science uh, in, in, the, in this week, in these ceremonies. But um, 
the thing about thought, could we one day read people's thoughts and as a result, is, is there a threat to privacy? I agree that there are very serious problems. I mean, for instance, uh, the experiments, which I briefly mentioned the other day, uh, where it seems that if you get people to watch a film and then you are recording various activities going on in their brain, and then if you try and, as it were, do clever things with computers so that you then see if you can rebuild a film from, from watching their brain activities, um, all that is about imaging on the whole. It tends to be about imaging. And uh, you know, one, one thing is that the images currently are extremely blurry and inadequate, but I don't think that's a, a fi fatal objection because uh, television started with blurry, feeble images too. Uh, there is, I think, a, a, a quite serious problem though, which is that if you primarily think in Im visual images, or alternatively in verbal imagery, just a, a sentence, which was you, you read that I uh, either have, a, I say I have a, a picture of a, a letterbox uh, comes into my mind, an image of a letterbox comes into my mind. Uh, what thought is that? Well, it might just be a random image, but it could be, everything depends on how you interpret it. If the image might come into my mind, because I've suddenly remembered I forgot to post a letter that should be posted. But it doesn't have to be that. It could be how lovely the ancient letterboxes are and so on. It could be an aesthetic thought. And similarly with words. Um, if I, uh, uh, you, you, when you uh, decode my neural activity, if you find me uh, that I'm actually silently saying to myself, um, oh, to be in England, now that April's here. I did actually have that thought in England this April, but it was entirely ironical because we had a lousy April this year. Whether it's climate change or not, I don't know. But uh, you know, I, I, if you just had the words, you wouldn't know what interpretation to place on it. Now, it may be that the obviously very complex processes involved in interpreting that will underlie these, as were the problems of meaning, if you like, it may be that they're going to be too difficult for neuroscientists to get at, or that there's some barrier in principle against their doing so. But on the whole, I mean, my prejudices are that philosophers have spent centuries saying this, that, or the other can't be done by science. Uh, I'm not, I'll wait and see. If it turns out that there are these barriers, then hooray, I don't need worry about the, this invasion of privacy. Mm -hmm. uh, but I should say, I, I mean, I vividly remember uh, my grandfather who was in the Royal Air Force during the Second World War. My grandfather telling me uh, why it was that space travel couldn't happen. And it was... <laughs> Something to do with, uh, well, the way you steer an aeroplane has something to do with the air. I'm, not, I'm just showing what a terrible non-scientist I am. Something or other to do with the, the air around. And in space, there's no air, so you couldn't steer. So no good trying to uh, But anyway, somehow that's turned out to be wrong. So I'm, I'm not sure whether to say optimistic or pessimistic that, that some of this kind of thing might happen. So let's go to the second question I had in that context. Let's assume that it would maybe it will become possible to do that. Uh, you defined it as a problem, ethical problem of privacy. Uh, I think it's even more radical. I mean, uh, for me, uh, such a, a state of the world in which we could read each other's thoughts, feelings, everything you will become completely transparent to me and I to yes. you, that would uh, break the idea of the individual altogether. It will mean dissolution of the individual. Don't you think so? It's not only that your privacy will be invaded in the ways it is already invaded by uh, various technological means, but you would lose the sense of self because I would have the same mental states as you, I'll be able to read your mental states and consciousness the same way as you do. 
by definition. So uh, what's the difference between that, that, you and me? That's, that's a very powerful question. I would like to precede answer, trying to answer it uh, by saying that the, this issue is one which I talked about in that book, and it's one, it's one where I really think I got it radically wrong. Because what I, what I said in the book was that uh, it seems frightening to know that everyone will be able to read each other's thoughts. But if we're all in that position, you know, I mean, of course, what I was thinking of was, you know, we don't want people reading our embarrassing sexual fantasies or whatever it is. But if we're all in that position, then the inhibition about it, the embarrassment and so on might go. Um, but I now think that I was very shallow in just rubbishing it in that way. Uh, I, I've been thinking this particularly because recently I've been writing a book trying to respond to Edward Snowden's revelations about surveillance and the hugely invasive surveillance things that have been developed. Um, and thinking about the value of privacy, uh, I now think that um, well, there are all sorts of things which I hadn't really thought about. I mean, for instance, uh, the American legal philosopher Charles Fried uh, pushes the idea, which is a very interesting idea, I think, that relationships depend upon us deciding how much to give to other people, uh, that intimacy uh, and, and relationships depend on me not, you know, I don't tell everybody my innermost thoughts, uh, but I do tell uh, my innermost thoughts, or nearly all of them, uh, to, to people close to me. Uh, <clears throat> but now turning to your very deep and interesting question, uh, would it mean there was no more individuality? I wonder. Uh, I mean, it might be that, supposing you and I disagree on this issue, as I think, once again, once again I'm not holding the thing. That's okay. uh, <laughs> uh, I, mean, I, I, mean, I think there's a degree of disagreement between us on this. Um, you, if, you, if, if, if I noticed that you were thinking it, rather than having to hear you say it, and you noticed me disagreeing with it by neurotransparency, I think we'd still be different. You'd be the person who thinks one thing, I'd be the person who thinks another thing. Well, what would mean? What would it mean that to say you and me, if we are completely transparent in any act of consciousness? The, the I is something which, the self-reflection is something which individuates me. Well, I agree. I agree. Well, it's, it's, I, I mean, I, I, okay. I agree. I agree that we, 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 we partly create ourselves in private. That's to say, uh, you know, also one of the things I'm struck by with undergraduates uh, often, uh, first year undergraduates particularly, they've left their home, they've come to university, and they do all sorts of weird experiments. You know, they suddenly. Uh, you know, have green and orange hair where they didn't before, uh, or they you know, take, take drugs they weren't taking before, or whatever it is. Um, and quite often, by the time they're 35, say, they're slightly embarrassed by having gone through this process. So uh, I think it's rather good that quite often, things we do, we experiment in private before having to show it in public. Virginia Woolf, in her book, A Room of One's Own, talks about the, uh, even a brilliant writer like Jane Austen was glad that there was a stair that creaked when people came up to her room, mm -hmm. uh, because it gave her the chance to push away the papers so people wouldn't say, oh, what are you writing? Let me have a look, mm -hmm. because she wanted to create in private. So I agree with that sort of thing, but I'm still not quite clear why it why, why it is that we exactly. have become the same person. You know, in a nudist colony, people can see bits of each other's bodies that, that in general public life they don't. Only the bodies, not the Only the bodies. But, <laughs> but I'm, you know, I'm not sure why seeing the mind has to be so different. Well, you I'll move to the uh, next question and uh, we can discuss it over dinner. <laughs> I, I, I totally, Losing individuality. I totally accept. I haven't provided a decisive refutation it's, of your criticism. You may well be right. It's, it's just the, the self-reflective or self-conscious is what constitutes the cogito, if you like. It's not that 
you have a certain mental state, but you have a mental state of your mental state. If that is uh, transparent to me, then I don't see the difference between you and me. Because then, unless you say, well, it's the body, the physical space, uh, which you take seriously. As, but as a mental state, I see a problem here. Anyway, that's uh, not yet with us, even with the most advanced uh, neuroscientists. I want to move maybe to one of before last uh, uh, question, or maybe last question. Um, your more recent book on humanity and, and the 20th century, it's a terrible history of the human evil um, on, in, in uh, the um, in the 20th century, which is, most of us have experienced part of it, at least, uh, depending on our age. But again, I'm interested in the more theoretical background uh, or assumptions behind the book. Um, you don't know, you mentioned, but you don't put focus on the huge benefits and progress and welfare and knowledge that we have advanced in the 20th century. So now the question becomes, uh, how can we balance each, the, the, the two of them? Because they, it was definitely the most murderous, uh, let's say, um, history in the uh, history, uh, century in the history of humanity, but also the most quickly advancement in, in uh, all technology and welfare and life expectancy, etc. So is there any way to balance them? And the deeper question, I think, philosophically speaking, is can we at all say, it goes back to the first uh, question about person affecting value, can we really say that it was a worse century than the 19th century or the 5th century BC or whatever period in since we compare apple and oranges, and we compare different people for whom this or that century was good or evil? Well, first, I, I agree. I, I didn't um, say whether it was the worst century yes. or not, uh, yeah. because my project was to, uh, we all agree that a number of pretty terrible public atrocities, you know, from two world wars, a genocide, other genocides, endless civil wars, all sorts of cruelty and torture. We all agree that that happened. Uh, and I, of course, agree that huge progress in other fields, you know, medicine in all sorts of ways is incredibly advantageous to the human race and became increasingly so during that century. But what I was concerned with was to try to look at the psychology uh, because, I mean, on the whole, I, uh, I, I drew hugely on the work of historians because I'm, I'm not a historian. I, I read as widely as I could, but there are obviously very severe limitations to that. But I was trying to see, are there psychological patterns which, so, which will give us ethical lessons to take away? You know, why is it that uh, certain wars occurred? Why is it? in detail that uh, why you know, what did people why did people become nazis what were the, the both the social and historical circumstances but also the individual psychology what made them dump the inhibitions most of us would have about those kinds of things so that my exploration was to look for patterns so that we can warn ourselves against naive rigid belief systems warn ourselves against the evils, evil consequences often of tribalism, uh, of uh, warn ourselves against lack of imagination. So the thrust of the book wasn't really about this, but you're quite right, David, to raise a, a question, how, can we make these comparisons? You say, can we balance them? I'm, in a way, I don't really, I'm not interested so much in, as it were, you know, does the 20th century score minus 90? whereas the 5th century BC only scores minus 60 or whatever, uh, because I'm not sure how one can do such balancing. Uh, I, I mean, what, you probably know Stephen Pinker's book, The Better Angels, Angels of Our Nature, where he produces an enormous amount of very impressive evidence, in my view, that uh, in many ways, 
we are very lucky to live in the modern world. Uh, you know, the 20th, really, it's, he concentrates on the post-enlightenment period, but you know, as it were, since the, the rise of humanitarian ideas in the enlightenment and the rise of science, the two things together have in many ways meant that many, you know, we live much uh, average, uh, life expectation is enormously greater. I don't know that I can do any balancing um, and I think that somebody being murdered in Auschwitz would be offended if one says, well, actually, this is outweighed in the surface, on the, in evaluating the 20th century by the progress. I don't want to say that kind of thing, but I, uh, I do, of course, accept that the simple, crude picture that the 20th century was the most disastrous ever, that applies in some circumstances, in some aspects, but not others. And what I think worries me is that the technology, it's the technology that makes it possible for a few evil people to bring about catastrophe. Um, and we haven't yet developed adequate means for controlling that technology. I mean, only a few weeks ago, I was thinking whether or not a nuclear war breaks out depends upon two mad fanatics. Finally, uh, uh, back to strict bioethics. Uh, um, I, it, it's in a way, I want to repeat the question uh, addressed to uh, Baroness uh, Warnock by Yael in the previous exchange. Do uh, you believe in moral expertise? Do you think we philosophers can have some something? Uh, beyond maybe the neutrality or the absence of vested interests, which is very important, of course, in uh, chairing committees uh, or taking part in committees. Do we have anything in substance to um, offer? To we being philosophers. Philosophers, philosophers right. Philosophers yes. in bioethics. I mean, I, and and uh, yes, uh, and, and that, of course, reflects on the general question of whether philosophers or moral philosophers like you have any, or may have, or should have any authority on moral issues in public life? Well, first I should say I was very glad that Mary chaired that committee. It came to enormously beneficial results in a rational way. Uh, but I think that philosophers have certain, I mean, I wouldn't want committees to be entirely composed of philosophers, and I'm sure <laughs> Ma Ma what, what Mary said uh, uh, indicated that she wouldn't either. She was glad to have people, people like Anne McLaren on the committee. Um, but I think philosophers have certain really important qualifications. Often, alas, they have a, a rather large disqualification as well. Uh, the qualifications philosophers have, I usually, I mean, not always they're bad philosophers, just they're bad scientists, but uh, the, uh, what I hope good philosophers bring is firstly uh, a background of having thought a lot about what it means to say someone has a right to something, uh, to th trading off how our consequences all that matter or do intentions matter, the whole range of things which philosophers have thought a lot about, so have a special expertise. Um, and that, I think, is not the only expertise needed, but it, uh, it makes, uh, it, I think, for a, a good chair of such a committee. On the other hand, and this is something which, in a way, I, I try to resist in my later work, um, quite a lot of philosophers have no clue about people at all. Um, uh, I mean, I'll, tell, I'll say one thing, I, I shouldn't really sort of take a particular example, but I've already praised Derek Parfit. <laughs> I've already praised Derek Parfit, but Derek Parfit was uh, you know, the nearest thing I've, I've known to a genius in philosophy. Uh, utterly brilliant. But uh, he wasn't all that great at uh, knowing what other people were like. So that, for instance, uh, one time uh, when I was at New College and he was round the corner in All Souls College, um, 
I thought I'd like to, uh, there's some big dinner at New College to, to invite guests to, so I thought I'd invite Derek. And so I called him up, and, uh, uh, and he really didn't want to come. And I knew that this was because he was so committed to his work. You know, he really was a, you know, an amazing kind of, you know, he used to read philosophy books while brushing his teeth and all that kind of thing. Um, and he, but he didn't want to hurt my feelings. So uh, he said, I, no, I don't think really I want to come. Um, of course, there's nothing I should like more than to spend an evening talking to you. But unfortunately, if I came to this dinner, I'd have to talk to other people as well. <laughs> and the, the, uh, the, you know, I've, I have my degree of vanity and self-deception, but I found it hard to believe that the human universe consisted just of me on the one hand, who he'd love to talk to, and all these other appalling other people who, you know, was such a waste of his time. Now, he was a lovely person, and I, I'm not you know, trying to attack him at all. He's a lovely person. I admired him enormously. He was a friend. But um, there, if you've got to be a little clueless about people to think that anyone's going to believe that particular excuse. And, you know, I've, I've known lots of philosophers. I won't go on with anecdotes of this kind, but, you know, there are hordes of philosophers. I, you know, I wouldn't want them to help my children cross the road. Um, and so, in, in one way, I mean, I don't want to sort of boast about myself, but uh, well, I've tried, and maybe unsuccessfully. But I, I, the mode of moral philosophy, which consists of trying to work out, test abstract principles by elaborate thought experiments, um, far-fetched science fiction thought experiments. That was, in a way, the, mes the method I used in the, the book about genetic engineering and whatnot. But I've increasingly come to think that what philosophy needs is actually something a bit more empirical about what people are like. So that in the book about um, the humanity, about 20th century history, you know, I tried to look at you know, what went wrong in the people, in the psychology of people who did these terrible things. And more recently, I've written a book on um, mental illness, trying to see what it's like from the inside, trying to understand psychology. Uh, this, philosophy should be done in many different ways. This is only one. I'm not trying to impose it on anyone else. But I, I hope that's a kind of rough answer to your question. I probably ever run into it. Conclusion is Derek Poffett would not be chairing a committee <laughs> fertilization or any public affair. I don't, want to, <laughs> I don't want to finish on a negative note about Derek. He was a wonderful friend, yeah, I, and I, uh, you I, and I have I both, benefit, both benefited from him in that class. Thank you, sir.